Welcome, happy warriors, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Thank you for being part of the show, and thank you for all you've done in uh, promoting the show, telling people about it, and encouraging other people to join in. Uh, we are on a number of different platforms now and uh, heard around the world with growing numbers, and that is very exciting for me, and it makes it very encouraging for me as well. So I thank you for that. Um, in um, Pennsylvania, uh, go west from the city of Philadelphia, so important in the story of America's founding. And if you go west for less than 100 miles, uh, you come to the country city of Lancaster, and Lancaster, Pennsylvania, is ground central for the Amish community. It is a, a very major Amish community, and it's, it's one that I've come to know. I've been in Lancaster quite often, and I have a number of very dear friends um, in Lancaster. Now, um, a number of Amish friends, a number of very dear Amish friends, and uh, uh, we have visited with them there, and they have visited our home. And um, how did I get to meet them? Well, I got invited to give a speech uh, to the Amish in um, somewhere around about the middle of 2020. Now, you might remember that the COVID uh, panic began, uh, I'm going to say February, March of 2020, and uh, it very quickly moved into a lockdown mode and nobody seeing anybody. And, uh, and cert certainly in the United States, uh, it, it kind of closed down normal life for more than a year. Uh, by the way, Sweden, the country of Sweden, did not do any lockdowns. They never did it. Not like Australia, not like Canada, not like the United States. In all of those three countries, draconian lockdowns. It was, it was, it was really quite shocking. Uh, but uh, in Sweden, nothing. And guess what? Their uh, medical results were no worse than America's or Canada's or Australia's. In some cases, uh, considerably better. So... Why am I telling you about Sweden if I'm talking about Lancaster, Pennsylvania? Because there actually is a link. And uh, I was telling you how I got to, to meet um, the, the Amish community. So what happened was that uh, I was invited to, to do a speech around about the middle of 2020, countries in total lockdown. And uh, they, um, they said, we, we presume you will be doing it um, through uh, the internet on, on the web, a sort of Zoom type presentation. Um, and I said, well, like, you know, because they told me there were going to be about 400 people there. And I said, so they're going to be 400 people on the Zoom call. And there was a long pause. And the person I was talking to said, well, Rabbi Lappin, as a matter of fact, we are not adhering to the lockdown. Uh, our churches are open, our schools are open, and we're actually having a live event. Everyone's going to be there, but we understand that you probably uh, will only want to, to do it by Zoom. Now, by that time, by, by mid-2020, you know, we're a good few months into this, and ordinarily, um, during that period, I don't know, I would have had, you know, I don't know, typically uh, maybe uh, seven or eight uh, speeches at churches, at corporate events, uh, you know, around the country. And I, I derive a great deal of energy and enthusiasm from those occasions where I get to meet several hundred people. I present a series of ideas. We have questions and answers. There's social get-together afterwards. I, I really get a lot out of it. So by mid-2020, I'm feeling quite dismal. Um, we all need human connection. It's fundamental to us. Uh, when in chapter 2 of Genesis, God said, not good for man to be alone, he wasn't talking only about uh, Adam getting married to Eve. It was a general proclamation describing the reality of all human beings. It's not good for human beings to be alone and isolated. And I was certainly feeling that. So uh, I... <laughs> 
I said, let me hear this right. You guys are actually having an event uh, in Lancaster. He said, well, we're not doing it in Lancaster uh, because uh, it's against the law. So we are doing it privately. We have a, one of our uh, members has a farm and he has a huge barn kind of arrangement at the farm uh, with enough seating for hundreds of people and we're bringing in the sound systems and everything else so it's going to be there but we'll set up a screen so everyone be able to, will be able to see you speaking from your home I said no then they're not going to need the screen he said what do you mean I said because I'm going to be there live I I'm so excited to hear <laughs> that there's actually real live human beings gathering um, you can't keep me away and he said, well, Rabbi, I just, I have to tell you that our policy has been that, uh, that we're all going to get COVID. Uh, we're not going to send our people to hospital. We don't believe in that. Uh, we think they'll be healthier at home. And we're sort of heading towards herd immunity. So to just let you know, you are going to be among people who've had it. Uh, a lot of people have had it. And I said, well, I'm exactly with you on that. I take it as a given that I'm going to have it. And um, I, uh, I, I, would, I, I think that will give me a more and safer immunity than the vaccine. And he laughed and he said, there's not a single one of us who've taken the vaccine either. And so uh, uh, I had a wonderful time. And then from then onwards, uh, I made a number of friends and I have spoken. Uh, again, there are business groups among uh, the Amish and uh, uh, some of them are uh, real estate investment groups and some of them are financial finance groups. But whatever they are, uh, I've been invited a number of times since then. And uh, and so I've spoken for them many times. Um now, more recently, of course, they're using regular auditoriums uh, in in that part of Pennsylvania. But at any rate, um, these are uh, the Amish people, and um, and and that's that, that's the approach that they took. You see, and um, and, I, and that was just fine with me. Why do I tell you all of this? Um, so it, it turns out there is a scholar called Steve Nolt, and he studies Amish and Mennonite culture, so he obviously spends a lot of time around Lancaster and also other parts of the country because there are large and growing Amish and Mennonite communities all around the country. And um, so he, he said that by May 2020, everything was already normal in the Amish community. So by uh, August, when I spoke for them, obviously the, um, they were you know, completely back to normal and just trying to, to cope. Um, and he said, uh, yeah, look, um, they, uh, they all got COVID, he said. He, he studied them, uh, but they, they wouldn't go to hospital. For the most part, they wouldn't. You know why? Because the hospital wasn't allowing visitors, and they believe it was more important, if you're sick, even very sick, to be home and have the ability to have people who love you around you uh, rather than go to the hospital and be isolated. So they took that position, and uh, then in March, 19, uh, in March 2021, um, the official news came out that Lancaster County Amish were reported to be the first community in the country to achieve herd immunity, uh, which means a large part of the population had been infected and now were immune and they could live life as normal. No vaccines, by the way. And um, so that, that's what happened there. Now, why, why do, I, uh, uh, why do I, I tell you this? Because it turns out that, um, that there was a story that came out in the Washington Post. The Washington Post runs a story um, noting that measles and chickenpox are spreading in Columbus, Ohio. Ohio. By the way, this was this article in the Washington Post was. Let me just take a look. I think it was uh, December twenty sixth, twenty twenty two if I'm not mistaken, December 26, 2022. So um, really quite recently from the time I happen to be recording this show. So uh, 
in um, the end of December 2022, the Washington Post runs the story that um, uh, measles and chickenpox are spreading in Columbus, Ohio. And the uh, the Washington Post says, and you know why it's spreading? Because people have hes- vaccine hesitancy. What's vaccine hesitancy? People have become distrustful of all vaccines. Hello? Do I blame them? I totally understand that. Because the COVID vaccine turns out to have been, well, certainly suspicious because, um, by the way, I, I was personally unsure of some of this, and so I actually went to check. And it's absolutely true. The authorities, whether it was the White House or the CDC or Fauci or uh, Burks, they actually did say that this vaccine would stop you getting it. And then they said it's going to uh, stop you passing it on. That turned out to be untrue. And then they said it's going to stop you getting it severely. And that turned out to be untrue. And so, not surprisingly, whether or not that vaccine was helpful, I think, I'm hoping the history books will one day reveal it's, you know, there are too many livelihoods on on the line and too many heads on the block for the truth to come out soon. But, you know, who would be shocked and horrified if it turns out that the whole thing uh, was um, wish medicine, that there was really absolutely nothing significant that the vaccine was doing. What happens if it turns out that the um, VAERS, V-A-R-S, is a system of reporting bad outcomes to vaccines to the uh, CDC? What happens if it turns out that these reports that have been coming in about young men dying from heart complications because of the vaccine or because of the booster. What happens if it turns out that the vaccine was actually harmful? And, and, you know, who would be absolutely horrified? I don't know. The thing is, it was rushed. It was a very new kind of vaccine. I don't understand the molecular biology involved, but I know that it was doing some strange things. It was turning parts of your body into a little factory for antibodies. I don't know. But at any rate, I don't know the details. I'm telling you I don't. But um, they're available, and I just haven't um, devoted the time to studying it up. But the bottom I'm what I'm getting at is that people who don't trust the government on vaccines now, have my sympathy. I don't think they're crazy. I think they're cautious. And now, in hindsight, I start asking myself, is it possible that the all of a sudden the, uh, s- the, the sensitivity to peanuts, right? When, when I was at school, there was no such thing. Right? It's a relatively recent phenomenon. All of a sudden... People have peanut allergies that can be very serious and very severe. And um, a lot of people that I speak to have have said that they suspect that it could be because of the escalated regimen of vaccines that newborns are subjected to. Tiny little babies, you know, weighing six, seven, eight pounds, no more than that, are getting so many vaccinations within a day or two of birth. And... um, you know, is there no downside to them at all? Guaranteed? Like this is the, the one medicine in the history of medicine for which there are no side effects? I don't know. I don't know. But it sounds funny to me. And so when people tell me that they are of the opinion that the intense sudden arrival of peanut allergies has to do with uh, the vaccine, you know, I... I'm, I'm open to, to the idea. Uh, I don't know, but I'm open to that. It's not impossible in my way of thinking. Um, all of a sudden, a tremendous increase in autism among uh, young boys. Again, are you absolutely sure that the entire cocktail of complex vaccines that are all administered together to little babies... Are you really sure there are no side effects? Could autism not be one of them? 
I don't know. But I do know that there were discussions and acknowledgement that it would be best to administer these vaccines to children during their first year, not all at once within a couple of hours of birth. But the uh, public health officials said, look, there's too many mothers who can't be trusted to bring the child back for well baby visits, and I believe that to be true, uh, so we better just get them in while we can. And so really little babies are really getting a lot of these vaccines pumped into their little bodies. And there's no side effects at all. It's only all good. No, I, it doesn't make sense to me. So what does make sense to me? And again, I'm speaking just as an amateur. I'm not, I have no more knowledge than any of you, probably less than many of you. But, um, but I think that the public health authorities in the United States of America and probably in other countries as well have probably taken the position that, yes, uh, there undoubtedly will be a certain number of people, uh, of babies who will react badly. But nonetheless, in the overall, for the public health of the country, it would be best to give it to people and then to deal with the medical complications of a small number of people who have bad side effects. That's what I think is the position that's been taken. And I think that's prob from a public health perspective, that's probably not unreasonable. But for a parent to say, you know what, I'm not interested in becoming one of your statistics. Um, if, you know, if we get measles, we'll get measles, we'll deal with it. If we get chicken pox, we'll deal with it. But we're not doing, and you know what, I don't find that unreasonable either. That's where I think it is. And uh, this is the, the, the Washington Post is very critical of backward people who, uh, who became suspicious of the wonderful COVID vaccine and then allowed that suspicion to roll over onto other vaccines. And so um, uh, they say uh, um, that's, you know, that's why there's uh, measles and chicken pox in Columbus, Ohio. And if you think back to how they treated during... Uh, 2022, when people expressed any concern about the vaccine, right? Um, what what did they say, right? And there were there were people who got reactions from the vaccine. No question about. It. I don't doubt that for a minute. And even even medicine um, has recognised that there've been people who got terrible reactions, including death, from the vaccine. Um, and again, if if there would have been acknowledgement of that and said, look, yes, it's mixed. Obviously, there are a small number of people who have bad effects. It's, it's, what would you expect if you're, you know, if you're vaccinating, you know, 250 million people? What do you think? Of course, there'll be some, but they didn't. The authorities mocked people for suggesting a link between deaths and illnesses from the vaccine, and they gaslit them, and. Um, and, and, and the whole machine in the United States of America, the whole um, ghastly apparatus that was created to ram through the approval of this vaccine, despite any safety signals that uh, were generated, um, yeah, look, that, that, is, that is what's going on. Anyways, why, why am I speaking about this now? Why did this Washington Post article... Um, strike me? Well, because it's a story about people getting chicken pox and measles in Columbus, Ohio, but the photographs, and I mean, you can go online for yourself and see this, because what I'm about to tell you is, is really rather mind-boggling. Uh, there are a number of photographs that the newspaper published uh, alongside the story Right, the headline is "Growing Vaccine Hesitancy Fuels Measles and Chickenpox Resurgence," and then it speaks about Columbus, Ohio. Right, that's what it's talking about. But the pictures, my dear friends, um, and you'll pardon me if I sound a, a tidy little bit personal here, but the pictures are all pictures of religious Jews in Brooklyn. You hear what I'm saying? It's a story about people who didn't want to get vaccinations in 
Columbus, Ohio, and some of whom are uh, seeing chicken pox and measles coming back. And the photographs accompanying the stories, let me read you the caption on one photo. There's a picture of a Hasidic guy. Now, I'm not Hasidic, but the difference between uh, Hasidism and a regular um, Torah-committed Jew are, mas- are basically, um, well, they're really cosmetic, right? The guy's wearing um, a long earlocks. Well, <laughs> I, for me, it's not even a question because I don't have much in the way of hair on my head. And uh, he's uh, wearing a long black coat, which uh, I don't unless it's terribly cold and I wear a regular winter coat, but it doesn't really look the same. And uh, he's wearing a yarmulke, a black skull cap, which, again, I do in at home and on the street I wear a hat. But uh, here's the caption. An Orthodox Jewish man walks with his children in Brooklyn during large measles outbreaks in 2019 that spread rapidly among hundreds of unvaccinated people in these New York communities. The article is about measles and chickenpox in Columbus, Ohio, and the photographs accompanying the picture are all of religious Jews in Brooklyn. I think they're all in Brooklyn. This I'm looking at another one. Uh, um, this one just shows a religious Jewish woman walking with a baby in a stroller, and uh, there's a sign. She's walking past a medical clinic, and there's a phone number that starts with 718, which is a Brooklyn area code. But this, anyways, okay, look, um, this is quite important, I think. You know, I think, that I really don't jump, I don't jump up and down crying anti-Semitism all the time. I really don't. Why not? Because um, I don't think it's a reality. Let me give you an example. Many Jews are talking about uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitism. Do you know how many Jews have been attacked in New York in, in the last two years? And the, the, the correct answer is yes, I do. And now, do you have any idea of how many Asian Americans have been attacked on the streets of New York in the last little while? And um, the attackers are, for the most part, African-American young males, and they're attacking everybody. I don't think they're necessarily singling, most of them certainly are not appearing to single out Jews. They're equal opportunity thugs because many of them are attacking Asian-Americans as well. And, um, and so Jews, like other law-abiding, peaceful people, do badly when law and order break down, right? We, we just do because, by and large, uh, we are not accustomed to violence. That's, that's the reality, right? I hope that makes sense. So what happens? I do think that there's a horrendous breakdown of law and order in America. I think it's worse in Democrat-run cities. I think it's very bad in cities like San Francisco that have district attorneys who were elected as a result of George Soros, a, um, a secularized person of Jewish ancestry who is harming America, in my view, seriously. Uh, these cities are suffering an incredible breakdown in law and order. And yes, there have been Jews that have been attacked in uh, Philadelphia and in San Francisco and in all the cities that have George Soros district attorneys, Los Angeles. Um, But to say that the assaults have been driven by anti-Semitism, that I am less confident saying because I think it's a broad-based collapse of law and order, and uh, Asian Americans are very underrepresented in crime in America, as are Jews, and they tend to be easy victims, because the truth of the matter is that there are not a lot of Jews or Asian Americans who, who look like uh, Hulk Hogan. There's not a lot of Asian Americans or Jews who stand six foot four and weigh 240 pounds and uh, you try and uh, slap them on the back of their head as some young thugs have been doing to people on the streets of New York 
uh, you won't live for long. But <laughs> uh, but Asian Americans and Jews make, for the most part, easy targets in this area, unless it happens to be in cities where the Second Amendment is jealously protected and uh, the uh, putative victim happens to be carrying a uh, nice thirty-eight special revolver with which he defends himself. But that doesn't happen very often at all because these attacks are, for the most part, taking place in cities that prohibit, for, to, for all intents and purposes, utterly prohibit private ownership of firearms. Coincidence? Do you think it's possible that thugs are more inclined to attack people from whom they have zero fear of a swift and deadly retaliation. Yeah, I don't think that's a coincidence. And so I'm not big on, oh, anti-Semitism is rearing its head. I'm not big on that. But this is anti-Semitic. This Washington Post story talking about Columbus, Ohio, and then posting pictures only of visibly identifiable religious Jews this is, without a doubt, trying to once again uh, recreate the medieval uh, slur that was responsible for the massacre of hundreds of thousands of Jews in different European countries during that period. And that was, you know, the Jews are poisoning the well. In other words, Jews are imperiling public health. And I don't know, you know, some of you are listening in countries around the world. Many of you are listening in many different countries around the world. And so I don't know if you had this experience at all, but something that uh, most everybody in the United States experienced during 2020 and 2021 uh, was the um, hostility with which people assaulted you if you weren't wearing a mask. Now, again, To anybody who takes the trouble to explore it in some depth, uh, the masks were virtually useless. The masking played almost no protective role whatsoever for anybody. However, they became a sort of totem during that period of time. And if you were not wearing a mask, you were a threat to my health. And people you know, get understandably uh, a little aggressive if you imperil their health. Uh, you, you know, it's not exactly like pointing a gun at their head. Somebody points a gun at your head, you know, and you have an ability to kill them, you know, go right ahead because you have no idea if that person's going to pull the trigger or not. And so, yes, if somebody is threatening your life, it's understandable that, that you get upset. Well, the... Um, entire governmental PR and propaganda pushed the idea that if you were not wearing a mask, you were harming and threatening and imperiling the lives of other people. And so um, there was a tremendous drop in the general gentility and friendliness of people on the streets of America. uh, And everyone looked at everyone else suspiciously. And if you were not wearing a mask, you got hate glares. That was going on all the time. And so uh, this, my friends, this Washington Post article from December 26, 2022, I would label as anti-Semitic because the article was all about how people who are not getting vaccinations are hurting everyone else. They're causing the likelihood that your kids will get measles and chicken pox. And then the photographs all showed visibly identifiable Jews. That is a problem. Um, nothing to be done about it. It's it's just, uh, you know, how things are rolling right now, I'm afraid. But uh, I think worthwhile being aware, and certainly if you happen to be a Jewish listener, then you certainly ought to be aware that uh, this is, um, this, I think, is dangerous anti-Semitism. Um, because when public ideas get um, shifted, when you can get people to start thinking a different way, um, you're only a step away from converting ideas to action. 
And as an example, I always cite the, um, uh, the anti-smoking campaigns that were so prevalent in America. They were never uh, as, as intense in Europe, and so you'll find people smoking in, in Italy and in Spain, uh, just you know, among countries that, that I've seen recently, but in many places. But in America, smoking is really, cigarette smoking has really been relegated to such an extent that if you stand outside your office building smoking a cigarette, again, you get hate glares from people because you are threatening public health, because the entire myth of secondhand smoke was so effectively propagated that if you're smoking, you're not just imperiling your own health, but you are imperiling mine. In other words, the public health bogeyman. And, um, and one of the fears I have for constitutional security in the United States of America is that I think that in the minds of more and more citizens, public health trumps everything else. And in the name of public health, I honestly could not think of many things that the government could not do while claiming to be protecting national health, public health. Very dangerous. And, um, and when you get people to think a certain way, it's not hard to get them to act. And so subtly, the Jews are threatening public health. That's the message of this Washington Post article uh, that was published on December the 26th, 2022, entitled Growing Vaccine Hesitancy Fuels Measles Chickenpox Resurgence in the United States. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you something that happened in 1895. That's, that's quite a long time ago. 5th of January, 1895. So we're coming up. Again, the anniversary is just a few days after I record this uh, particular show. What happened in, on January the 5th, 1895? Well, I'll give you a clue. It happened in Paris. It happened in a beautiful big park on the banks of the Seine River, uh, and at the north end of the park is the Eiffel Tower. So it's quite a well-known park, the Champ de Mars. And I'm sure I'm <laughs> mispronouncing that. I do not know French at all, unfortunately. Um, what happened on January the 5th, 1895, in a ceremony uh, conducted in the big park on the banks of the Seine? Um, it may give you a clue if I tell you that the 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 West Point of France, the, 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 the senior most important military academy, is right there on the park. What happened was that a, a Jewish artillery officer and husband and father uh, who had been convicted of treason in a rushed court-martial a few days earlier uh, underwent a public degradation before a big crowd. His medals were stripped from him uh, his sword was broken over the knee of the officer who was degrading him, and he was marched around the park in his ruined uniform uh, while the crowd jeered at him and spat at him, and, uh, and, uh, and it, people were all yelling out, Jew, Jew, Jew. This is what is known as the Dreyfus Affair, and the young soldier was Alfred Dreyfus. And... Um, you know, look, um, it was, it was an, in, there is no doubt that, again, in hindsight, uh, even I, who, and I do not find anti-Semites hiding under every bush, uh, I think the main problem to Jews in America is not anti-Semitism, but it's the collapse of the Constitution, uh, the collapse of law and order. I think those things are tremendously threatening to, to Jews in America, but they are to every law-abiding citizen, you see? But there is no doubt that in 1895, at the beginning of that year in Paris, what happened was anti-Semitic. In other words, had Alfred Dreyfus not been a Jew, what took place never could have happened. Um, it's, um, I mean, just the, the, the thing you have to remember is that France was in a period of turmoil. I think they were in, if I'm not mistaken, I think they were in the third um, constitution since the French Revolution, you know, which was a hundred years early, at least the third, maybe, maybe even more. 
there's been tremendous political turmoil. Um, Napoleon died in 1821 on an island in the South Atlantic. And, um, and the, the turmoil into which Napoleon threw Europe, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, the Congress of Vienna was 1815, where the, the new um, international order of governments in Europe was established. And also there's a part of France that constantly shifted between France and Germany called the Alsace-Lorraine area. I've, I've been there. Um, and the reason I've been there is because to this very day, um, there's a very big Jewish population there. Why, you know, people, Jews lived there. If France got bad for them, they crossed over the border and lived in Germany. If Germany got bad, they crossed over the border into France. And the border very often shifted uh, backwards and forwards. So sometimes Alsace-Lorraine was German, sometimes it was uh, it was French. Anyway, the Alfred Dreyfus family are, were, are from Alsace-Lorraine. Jews had lived there for many, many, many centuries. And um, what happened was that... Um, and, and this is a really a very, very scary thing. What happened was that uh, for political reasons, powerful politicians in France needed to have something happen and they needed to have somebody to blame and somebody to put on trial and somebody to point a finger at. And so uh, because of the tensions between Germany and France and because uh, Alfred Dreyfus was a Jew from Alsace-Lorraine, they were able to trump up a case that he uh, was a German spy in the French military. And uh, he was sent away for five years, he sent away for life to a place called Devil's Island, which is an island off the northeast coast of South America. Uh, there's a little country there called French Guyana, and off the coast is this tangled, horrible little island. Um, some of you who are movie enthusiasts might remember a Steve McQueen movie from 1973. It's a while back, and it was called Papillon, which means butterfly in French, apparently. I do not know any French, but I just remember the movie. And it was a, a true story about a, uh, a guy in France, I think it was 1933, so well after the Dreyfus Affair of 1895. 1933, this... Uh, um, I think he was a, a petty criminal. I don't remember the details, but he got uh, convicted and sent to Devil's Island. And the movie is all about the friendships between him and some of the other prisoners and the brutality of the guards and the several escape attempts that they made. And I just remember the very end of the movie had Steve McQueen standing on a cliff. He'd been recaptured after an escape and, and he was standing on a cliff and um, he noticed that the waves, for a moment, the waves at the bottom of the cliff made the water deep enough to let you survive a jump. And, um, and he jumps off the cliff, and I think a sort of note on the screen comes up saying that escape was successful. Anyways, Devil's Island Prison was a horribly brutal place, dreadful, dreadful place, and... Um, they they closed it since then, and today it's all overgrown. The prison you can still see, but it's it's all totally overgrown. Actually, I haven't tried looking at it on Google Earth. I bet you can see it. Uh, but at any rate, the, uh, the 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 bottom line is Dreyfus gets sent to Devil's Island. His brother, Alfred Dreyfus's brother, is the hero of the story. He doesn't stop. He does not stop, and. Um, and, and the complication here is there are very powerful politicians who, uh, whose interests are vested in Dreyfus remaining in prison uh, because their role in railroad, ra railroading him would damage their careers. So Alfred Dreyfus's brother, it takes him five years. And one of the big helps is when a, uh, a novelist called Emile Zola who I think was not Jewish, wrote a story that was published all over about the Dreyfus affair. And that turned it into a cause celebre. And that, along with the legal work of the brother and other people who began to get involved, resulted in Alfred Dreyfus being released from Devil's Island. And then a few years after his release, I think he was exonerated and it was acknowledged that he was uh, had been railroaded. He was totally innocent of the charges and he was restored 
to the military, and he got his, uh, his, his rank back, but he suffered five years on Devil's Island while his family struggled to obtain his release from an absolutely unjust um, assault which could never have happened um, had he not been Jewish. So, yes, there are occasionally, there are real incidents of anti-Semitism. There's no question about it. Uh, today, I believe that the the main um, locus of anti-Semitism, again, I'm talking about the United States of America, you know, in in other countries, in, in Ghana, for instance, where I had a wonderful visit just before COVID, uh, I didn't feel any anti-Semitism uh, people couldn't. Everybody was was wonderful and friendly, uh, and uh, in many countries, in uh, in Taiwan, uh, no problem. You know, no problem at all. But it's it's a reality. Where in America do you find anti-Semitism? Um, Democratic Party, no question, um, and universities, no question. So today. Uh, anti-Semitism is very much a creature of secular fundamentalism. Anti-Semitism today is a creature of the left, no question about it. And um, why, you know, why would that be? Uh, what what could be causing that? And um, the answer. And uh, and I'll I'll tell you a little bit about that. I uh, must first of all, however, ask you to visit my website rabbi daniel lappin.com and i would ask you to take a look at a free half hour lesson in the series called scrolling through scripture it will cost you nothing but it will expose you to some remarkable things about the bible now whether you are a Bible believer, or maybe you're not a Bible believer, maybe you have no interest in the Bible at all. But even if you have no interest in the Bible at all, uh, I would like you to go ahead and listen to this half hour or watch this half hour video um, because the significance of this book cannot be overstated. As much as one wishes, one can pretend and ignore that it doesn't happen and that it doesn't, that it's not real. Uh, but the problem is that it has played an enormous role in human society. It's been a very, very, very big deal. And so you ought to know something about it. And you also ought to know something about what it means in the original Hebrew because a translation is merely an interpretation based on the ideas and visions of the person who did the translation, of the translator. But to be able to see it in the Hebrew, and I understand, obviously, you know, you probably don't know Hebrew, that's fine, but I present this in a way that even those who don't know Hebrew can see it through the lens of an authentic Hebrew understanding. And so um, there, there are so many foundational principles laid out in the first 34 verses of Genesis. And that's what scrolling through scripture unit one is all about. And that's what the free half hour, you can hear me teaching for half an hour. You can watch me teaching. It's nothing to look at, but you can certainly uh, watch and hear me teach for half an hour on these uh, first verses in Genesis. And I'd, I'd recommend it because uh, what I, what I want to show is just how significant it is, how little you can understand about how the world really works without it. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that so much of what happens in life around you happens because of spiritual, not physical reasons. And by spiritual, by now, many of you already know that I do not mean religious or godly. When I say spiritual, there are a lot of things that are spiritual that have nothing to do with God or religion. Spiritual means things that cannot be measured by science. And so uh, when you hire somebody for your company, and you're hiring somebody and you're doing your best to try and determine their integrity, 
you are trying to hire on a spiritual quality. Maybe you're looking for a job and you realize you have to convey. You've got to find a way of conveying your integrity. That's a spiritual thing. Um, if you are trying to form a romantic relationship, you need to understand spiritual qualities because without them, you won't be able to relate to the essence of what the other person is looking for. A woman is looking for certain spiritual clues. A man is looking for certain spiritual clues. And knowing what they are puts you in a much better situation. Um, every time you make a decision to buy a brand item instead of a generic item, you are making a spiritual decision. You're saying, I'm going to go on reputation. Every time you buy a piece of clothing from one manufacturer with the, rather than another, and it's not because it'll last longer or it's stronger, but it's because you feel good in that item of clothing from that manufacturer, uh, you are making a spiritual decision. And the Bible is the foundation of understanding the spiritual. The Bible is not about the physical at all. And so don't for a moment think that the opening of Genesis speaking about how God created the world, that's not a course in astrophysics that would enable you to create a universe on your kitchen table one evening. No, it's all spiritual disclosure. And what I've just told you now has enormous value. And so head over to uh, rabbidaniellappin.com, rabbidaniellappin.com. Don't forget to put two L's in there, right? There's an L at the end of Daniel, and there's another L at the beginning of Lappin, L-A-P-I-N. Um, and look for Scrolling Through Scripture, Unit 1, and then look for the free um, lesson. You will find it absolutely eye-opening. It will be incandescently shocking. It really will. If, you, if you're not seeing anything, if you don't know anything about this, because don't forget, you are already a product of, um, you know, 70 years of secular fundamentalism ever since, I think, of 1962. But, you know, you got the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, um, you know, 60 years of this. And so whether it's through school or anywhere else, uh, you've been conditioned to believe that the spiritual doesn't exist, that science is the big answer to everything, and nobody ever said to you that no instrument explains everything. There is no such thing. Uh, you have a thermometer. You know, you've got to find out what the range is. Some thermometers are good for the weather. Others are good for melting steel. Others are good for working in the Arctic. Uh, different instruments are used for a Geiger counter. Cannot tell me if there are radio waves around. For that, I've got to use something else. Every instrument. Science is a very, very valuable instrument. But like all instruments, if you don't know how to use it or you make the mistake of thinking it can answer everything, you're going to get yourself into a mess. And so that's why I say everybody should uh, listen to that. Everyone should get a sense of the spiritual realities of life because you will find yourself applying them in your life without question. You will all the time. So uh, rabbidaniellappin.com and you look for the scrolling through scripture unit one and um, there you go. That's how that's going to work. As soon as you find the free lesson, grab it, you'll enjoy it. Now, um, you know, as as you hear me saying things like this, and it's it's certainly very um, uh, very worrying because, you know, we all we all grow up believing that science explains everything, and that uh, a, a perfectly adequate rebuttal to someone's argument for which you don't care would be well, that's hardly scientific, and that sort of ends the conversation, uh, because we've all been conditioned to believe that. But um, uh, there was a wonderful. Um, biologist, professor of biology at Harvard University called Richard Lewinton. He lived to well into his 90s. He only passed away a little while ago. Uh, and Richard Lewinton wrote the following. I saw this in the New York Review. And uh, he, they published it in 1997. You know something? I'm not sure they would publish it today. I just want to read you one paragraph of what he wrote. 
and listen to it carefully. And because of the wonders of this being a podcast, you can actually go back and hear it again and maybe a third time. And when I finish reading it now, you'll see why I say that, because you will probably want to hear this carefully more than once. Um, I'm now quoting Professor Richard Lewinton, a biologist and a secular, a secular scientist, by the way. Uh, make no mistake about it. Anyway, he, and he, he speaks in the article about that, but I'm going to read you one paragraph. Please listen to this. Enjoy it. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated, just-so stories. Why? Because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Did you hear that, my friends? We have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. That's the scientist telling you that only materialistic things can be studied by science. I'll finish the paragraph. Back to Richard Lewinton's words. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. End of quote. Isn't that something? You'll hear it a second time, and then you'll see how extraordinary that is. And so um, I started this whole conversation saying that, uh, you know, why is there so much anti-Semitism on the left? Why is it coming at us from the Democratic Party in America? Why is it coming at us from uh, the universities with their deep commitment? Well, here's the answer, you see. The existence of Jews makes it impossible to ignore the Bible. It really is as simple as that. Voltaire, the French philosopher Voltaire, who was a secularist and a materialist, he wanted the Bible to become out of print. Like many books are out of print, right? There are lots of books that are published much more recently than the Bible, and they're out of print. You can't get a copy. But the Bible keeps on going. Why? <laughs> That's part of what I explain in scrolling through Scripture, you see. And so... Uh, if there were no more Jews in the world, then it would be much easier for the Bible to go extinct. But the fact that there are Jews and the fact that Israel has come to life again in the Middle East, all of these things make it impossible to ignore the Bible. And that is why people on the left hate Jews. Jews make it impossible to ignore the Bible. And if there's one thing they want to do, if there's one thing science wants to do, it's ignore the Bible. And Richard Lewinton calls it um, uh, the supernatural, right? But you can just call it the spiritual things that science does not address. Science is not the right tool to understand. That's all. Because science's primary commitment is to materialism. And Judaism confirms the Bible, and the Bible confirms that the world is not 100% materialistic. And the Bible confirms that people are not just a cunning combination of chemicals, but that we are body and that we are soul. And the emphasis of denying the difference between male and female to such an insane level that you know, you know that the left is going to have to back down from this eventually. It's an insanity. Men and women 
are interchangeable. It's an insanity. Why are they doing it? Only because there is a desperate urge to reaffirm materialism. And I would have to agree that men and women are basically the same physically, materially. Yeah, I I understand there's some plumbing differences, minor plumbing differences, but the functions are basically the same. If you believe the world is physical and material only, then men and women are pretty much the same. The fundamental differences between men and women, the differences that make sexual tension real and make romantic love so exquisite, these are spiritual. They're not physical, they're spiritual. And so, yes, it's very understandable. Uh, when, when Berkeley University hires a vice provost of equity and diversity and pay this person over nearly a quarter of a million dollars a year and give that person a staff of nearly 20 people where the overall costs of this newly created office of diversity are well over a million dollars a year, and the function of the office to make sure that people that are hired, that new hires and new admissions, both student admissions and faculty hires, are going to be leaning towards minority, everyone understands what that means, and female, minority and female. Now, Something that we have to understand, and I'll I'll wrap up with this, I think, something that's worthwhile understanding um, is that uh, um, there's a lot of differences between men and women. And as I said, most of them are spiritual. There are some small physical ones. Uh, One of the physical ones is that women tend to cluster around the mean in a normal distribution. Um, Men are much further from the mean. What do I mean? Well, on many characteristics, like height, for instance, if um, if you drew a graph and you graph the height of everybody in your country, you'd end up with what's called a normal distribution curve. Sometimes it's called a bell curve. And you have a few people at the low end, like in other words, there's very few people who are very short, and there are very few people who are very tall. The bulk of us fit into the middle, the big body of the bell in the in, in the middle. And right down the vertical uh, axis of symmetry of the bell uh, is the mean. And uh, men vary, uh, well, let's put it this way, the mean is uh, 70 inches in the United States of America for men. Um, that is five foot ten, and it's um, I think five foot, if I'm not mistaken, five foot four or five foot five for women, um, and that's a difference between men and women. But what's an even more important difference is that the um, the uh, standard deviation for men is about five inches, and the standard deviation for women is about two inches. What that means in, in ordinary, non-statistical, just lay terms, what that means is that the vast majority of women are clustered around the mean. There are very few outliers, very few very short women and very tall women. With men, the standard deviation is larger, meaning that there will be a very... Um, there will be a number of men who are very, very short. There'll be a number of men who are very... So the shortest men are way shorter than the shortest women. And the tallest men are way taller than the tallest women because the, uh, the extremes that men go to is very different from women. That is also true in math uh, and physics and, um, and, and engineering and science and computer. That is true there as well. And that is that there are many, many men who are utterly clueless. Um, And there are also men who are better than the best women. That's just a reality because of these standard deviation realities. It's not only true in height. uh, It's also true in criminal behavior. It's true in head size. um, And it also explains why out of uh, about 1,700 grand masters of chess in the world, only about 40 are women, right? It's very simple because the best 
men chess players are way better than the best women chess players. They just are. And uh, the worst men are way worse than the worst women. Not only in chess, in, in, in almost everything. Um, so that is a, a very important point because if ordinarily, you know, if you're hiring a uh, faculty for a university, you want the people who are the very best. If you're admitting students to your university, you want the most qualified students. And um, if you uh, do that, you will end up with more men in the sciences. You will end up with more women in some of the arts and humanities, again, because of the same distribution curve. Um, and so in order to avoid that, they are now hiring not by quality of the candidate, but by color of the skin of the candidate and the gender of the candidate. All I can say is that people in China probably are rolling on the floor laughing hysterically, knowing that uh, they are well on the road towards overtaking the United States of America because they are not hiring faculty at their top universities in this fashion, and they are not admitting students to their top universities in this fashion. Uh, now, the, the reason, again, that you do this is because, you know, if you believe that human beings are just another creature on the animal spectrum, you know, we've evolved more in some ways, less in other ways, and uh, we are really nothing but materialistic and physical creatures, just like baboons. Um, well, then you do believe that the only reason that some people do not perform in some areas as well as others must be because of external factors. In exactly the same way that if you get two cows of the same breed and of the same age and of the same state of health, they will both deliver the same amount of milk, roughly. Pretty, pretty close, actually. And if that doesn't happen, then the farmer would be right to look for external factors. In other words, animals can be the same. Animals are totally predictable. And if they behave in unpredictable ways, they must be external circumstances because they don't have the will to be different. But human beings, indeed, are spiritual. And when a human being performs, let's look again at Jews. People often say the problem with Jews is they're too good with money. Well, if, uh, if you have a choice of living among people with no money or people with a lot of money, where would you rather live? Who is more likely to be able to pay you for your services, whatever you do, right? Who's likely to have cleaner streets, right? Obviously, it's good to be among people with a lot of money. Part of the evidence of that is how every country that expels its Jews slides to obscurity. Right? There have been many countries that have expelled all their Jews, and it's turned out to be really, really bad. England did that in the 12th century, in the 1200, actually the 1200s, and um, went very badly for them until Oliver Cromwell in the 1600s opened the doors to bring the Jews back because they needed the financial productivity. And so uh, it's important, I think, to, to realize that Jews are better at, at well, I shouldn't say better, but they're disproportionately good with money, not because of any physical characteristics and not because of any outside positive, you know, it's reverse bigotry, but because of internal qualities. Money is so closely tied to the spiritual that people with a strong connection to the Bible and with a, an understanding of and an affinity for the spiritual obviously are better off financially. And that's one of the reasons that the history's most successful engine of prosperity, the United States of America, was founded and for many, many, many years operated as a Bible-centric culture, not a government. It was a secular government, but it was a Bible-centric culture. You only have to look and see how the church was the center of every small colonial town. That's how it used to be. And uh, is it an accident that since the 60s, um, while there have been upticks, the general trend for America's economic dominance in the world has been heading downwards, makes perfect sense to me.
and uh, if you take a careful look at it, probably will to you as well. So, so yes, I uh, I think I get the core of anti-Semitism, and I do understand why it tends to come from the left. I get that as well. Um, that there are always um, stormtroopers and thugs who will take it to the street. I, I understand that's a painful reality of what does happen when law and order breaks down. And it's bad for every single law-abiding, productive, tax-paying citizen. That is the huge tragedy. So, uh, my friends, uh, the um, the news is always good in the sense that when you understand these things, you can better plan for them and better make sure that you will enjoy another week of growing your family, your friendships, your finances, your faith, and your physical fitness. A week in which you will move onwards and upwards. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.